We'll let some more people trickle in, but we might as well go ahead and get started. So hello, welcome to Project Monarch. My name is Remy, and I am the assistant to the founder and CEO here at HipCamp. Um, we're going to get started by introducing some of our speakers. Um, let's see, to start, we have Felipe DeAndre, a 10-time Emmy award-winning wildlife filmmaker, Geo Wild TV host, and passionate nature enthusiast who will be sharing about the importance of grassroots community-led conservation and why saving the migratory monarch is so important. We have Matthew Shepard, who is the director of outreach at Xerces, who we've been partnering with for Project Monarch. Um, Matthew is going to be sharing important information about the monarchs, their epic migration, and what monarchs are looking for while on migration when they pass through your hip camp. Next, we have Ray Morans, a grazing lands pollinator ecologist at the Xerces Foundation, who will be discussing best practices for monarch stewardship on working lands. Uh, Ray will be sharing some suggestions on how to prioritize your stewardship efforts and how those suggestions might vary from small to large properties. Uh, he'll discuss noxious weed management strategies and share where hosts can find more resources that cover the spectrum of management strategies and weed management best practices. And finally, I'd like to introduce Charles Post. Charles is HipCamp's resident ecologist who has helped us build this project. He is going to be talking about the conservation value of protecting monarch butterflies and how hip camp hosts like yourself uh, have a unique opportunity to help save them. And then we are going to wrap up with some Q&A. I know we had some people submit some Q&A questions in advance when they registered. Uh, we'll have some time at the end to answer questions live. Also, feel free if you have questions to put them in the chat. Um, make sure when it says who are, like, who are you sending it to, you click everyone so we can make sure everyone sees your question. Um, and then we will have someone on our team helping answer questions throughout the webinar. Um, and we'll also, like I said, have time to get some more questions answered at the end. Uh, typically, our CEO, Alyssa Ravazio, is here to join us for Project Monarch uh, webinars. It's one of her passion projects for sure. She wishes she could be here, but unfortunately, she was in Florida. And as some, some of us in the US know, a, a tropical storm is passing through right now. So uh, she created a little video she wanted me to share. So I'm just going to kick off with that. Right. Hi, everybody. Alyssa, founder and CEO of Hip Camp here. I uh, wish that I could be there with you guys today so much. Um, I'll be on a flight currently boarding, um, there's a hurricane coming into Orlando where I've been at a conference, so we'll be missing it. Um, but thank you so much for all you're doing. Um, Hip Camp is really founded on the idea that when we get more people outside, we connect them with nature and we build that passion for protecting nature and everything that it does for our planet and for each other. Um, so thank you all for what you're doing. Um, for those of us who are here who are already connected with the land, you know, it's just so important to learn and share uh, knowledge about how to better take care of it and the monarchs in particular right now. Um, I've been so encouraged to see both in my local neighborhood um, as well as in the news, like really, you know, encouraging numbers um, coming in. Still a very small fraction of what they should be, but the monarchs are arriving um, in a lot of their overwintering sites. And um, it's just so exciting to be part of this movement together. So thank you for all that you're doing. I uh, wish I could be there and hope to see you all soon. Bye. Excellent. All right. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Charles Post so you get us started. Awesome. Thank you so much, Remy. I'm just going to pull up uh, some slides here. Let's see. Um... Sorry, let me just get this in the presentation mode. All right, can everybody see that? Looking good? Looks good. Awesome, sweet. Well, thank you everybody for coming. My name is Charles Post. Um, as Remy shared, I'm Hip Camp's resident ecologist, which is a super fun uh, role that's dynamic and uh, has allowed me to work on a lot of different projects over the years. Project Monarch is one that means so much to me and also to Alyssa and the brand and community and company. It's something that is 
representative of what's at stake with our planet. We're losing biodiversity at an alarming rate, and yet we still have these, these symbolic organisms like the monarch that are hanging on, that are coming back, that are resilient, and that can really turn things around with our help. And so recognizing the opportunity, we reached out to some of the best that there are in the business, and that's Xerces Society. Um, they have been doing this work for a long time. They are passionate, they're experts, and they have professionals working across the country doing a number of things from supporting community efforts to biology on the groundwork, to advocacy and education and communications. And so we couldn't think of a better partner to have for Project Monarch than Xerxes. And from a HITCAMP perspective, like Alyssa said, you know, leaving it better, connecting with nature, creating opportunities for more people to connect with nature, these are really kind of pillars and cornerstones of HIPCAMP. And so Project Monarch really kind of checks a lot of boxes for us. It's, it's touching on our passion, it's touching on our mission, and it's touching on this opportunity that we recognize where we can hopefully activate this community to join this groundswell and help save monarchs. And one of the mechanisms and the levers that we've created in partnership with Xerxes is our pledge. As you can see on the right, there are just a few a few things we can do as hosts, as landowners, that can have a massive impact on monarchs. And so one of the things that we're uh, addressing and emphasizing throughout Project Monarch's history are these, these best practices on the right. And uh, maybe in our chat, we can share a link to the pledge. If you haven't already uh, signed it, or if you haven't been on our landing page, there's a bunch of information and resources. Also Xerxes has, uh, a, a library of information that you can dig into on your own um, af after this uh, this webinar. But thank you for being here. I'm coming to you from Norway. Uh, it's a little bit later in the day. I was happy to get some good internet. So I'm uh, really excited to dive in uh, to today's webinar. And before we go much further, I, I kind of wanted to set the stage. Like for me as an ecologist, I've, I've been on this kind of meandering path, right? And one of the things that I, I come back to time and again is, is the why. Why do we do this work? Why do I wake up in the morning and feel compelled to put my time and energy and my heart and my passion into this conservation stewardship work? And I'm sure all of you as hosts and stewards in your own right and your own ways, you know, ask this similar question, like why is it that you, that you do what you do uh, with such zest and, and passion? And this is a really cool Japanese concept called, called Ikigai. And it's something that I come back to all the time. And, and really what you can see here is it's this confluence of what you love, what you're good at, what the world needs and what you can get paid for. And so in my mind, Project Monarch really encapsulates a lot of this, 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 this center, center point, this, this focal point. And so I'm sure we can all interpret this in our own way, but it's kind of a fun exercise to think about as you, you know, look out your window at the land and the nature that uh, you're stewarding and ask yourself, you know, why do I care? Why should I care? Where can I pull energy from as I embark on this, on this journey? And this is something I saw recently uh, that came about, I think, through the latest election cycle. Um, I, you know, crossed out uh, the word that was there, I think it was zero waste and added monarch butterfly stewardship, but you know, the, the point here is that there's no perfect way to be a steward. There's nothing, per, you know, there, there, nobody's telling you that you have to do a perfect job. Really the important thing here is for us to get started. It's to put that first uh, milkweed in the ground. It's to take that first step on this journey. It's to wake up and decide that this is something that calls you. And this is work that, that fills you up and and, and gives you that, that ikigai, that sense of purpose. And there's no perfect way to do it. There's no perfect way to be a steward. And the whole, the, the goal here is that at scale, we can really have a tremendous impact. And so just starting, that's like the biggest, uh, maybe the biggest hurdle, but also once you get through the door, that's where the real magic happens. And this is like the context. Every dot you see here is one of you. Every dot you see here is a hip camp host. And for everybody who's listening to this, you've probably just hosted a monarch butterfly. You've probably just provided 
food, shelter, habitat, a place for rest and refuel for these wayward travelers who in some cases are traveling over 2000 miles to their overwinter sites, possibly in Mexico, possibly on the coast, um, possibly on the coast. And so this just shows that at scale, we can do great things together. Just starting on your stewardship journey is, is massive. And you can feel alone in this work. You can feel like that little bit of restoration or that, that single uh, milkweed plant or that single day of, of, of stewardship work isn't so significant. But when you pull back and you realize you're part of a, of a broader community, part of a groundswell, you know, all these little dots are people just like you asking these big questions of how can I leave it better? How can I have a positive impact on nature? How can I be a part of something that is good and doing good? And so don't forget this, like you are part of this, this, this broader community and with inspiration and with uh, a little bit of motivation, I think we can do really wonderful things for the planet and for the migratory monarch butterfly. Let's see. And so we see headlines in the, in, in the news, I'm sure, that talk about biodiversity declines, talk about kind of what we're up against with the climate crisis. But one of the things that, that really speaks specifically to this, this audience, our community, the hip camp community, is that a leading cause of species decline is habitat loss. So that's the conversion of something that was nature into something that's no longer nature. And by being a steward, you are actively preserving habitat. That land is remaining as land, that nature is remaining as nature. And so by just being a part of this equation, you are actively part of this, this movement, this, this energy that is keeping biodiversity on our planet, that's preserving biodiversity, that's keeping nature intact. And so again, it's, it's no small thing. You are a part of the solution by just keeping that land out your window as land and that nature out your window as nature. And so as we dig into the rest of the webinar and as you dig into your land stewardship journey, don't forget some of these things. Don't forget that you're part of the community. Don't forget that there's support and there are resources out there, like all the resources that the Xerces Society has available for free for anybody who wants to uh, to do more research, to continue their education and their journey. And remember that there's people like Felipe who you'll learn from that are out there in the world bringing stoke and energy into conservation and stewardship. And success happens when we feel invested, when our heart's there. And so you all are already part of the solution. You're already on the side that is actively saving nature. And the migratory monarch butterfly is actively benefiting from this, this energy and from this movement. So I'm really happy you're here and I'm really excited to learn more from our, our panel. And um, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Charles. All right, next up we have Felipe. And Felipe is our guest host for today's webinar and he's going to teach us about the importance of grassroots groundswells to safeguard biodiversity and what saving the migratory monarch butterfly means not just for nature, but also for society. Take it away, Felipe. <clears throat> How are you guys doing today? I am thrilled to be here. Uh, normally I'm in the jungles of Costa Rica chasing jaguars, snakes, butterflies, but right now I'm in the jungles of Los Angeles. Um, so yeah, hopefully my Wi-Fi will hold throughout this. It's been a little flaky, but, I feel I'm feeling a good vibe. I'm feeling like, you know, I'm ready to strut and show some tiger tails. So yeah, I'm thoroughly excited to be here. I'm obsessed with uh, pollinators. I'm obsessed with keystone species, not just in the biological sense, but also the role that keystone species can play as ambassador animals. And so if you think about the monarch, it's such a great ambassador for nature. It's so identifiable. It's something that we can all relate to that we've all seen in our backyard or can point to like even if we haven't seen it and understand what it is. And so for me being a conservationist, I prefer to use images in films 
as my tool, as my ability to create that stoke, as Charles mentioned, and get people excited, getting people feeling alive about nature, and just really rather than cursing the darkness to light one candle, because with all the issues that we're facing in the world today, I see it as an opportunity, right? We're such a capable species in the sense where we put people on the moon, where we can broadcast live safaris from around the world to a passionate audience that wants to hear stories from nature. So no matter where you are, you can get your fill of nature. And I see that as my responsibility to pass that on. So just a little bit about my background. I, I work primarily for National Geographic. I'm a Nat Geo Explorer, but I also make films for Netflix, Apple TV, Disney. We're actually working, we're wrapping a film right now on pollinators in Costa Rica. We've got a lot of blue morpho butterflies, a lot of hummingbirds in that film. And it talks about how pollinators, their job is to breathe life into everything that they come into contact with. And so, you know, we're going to talk a lot about migration here as, as it relates to monarchs. They can make a migration of 3,000 miles per year, up to 3,000 miles per year, and remember food sources along the way. I've been here in LA for a week, and I need a GPS just to go find a cup of coffee. You know, So we see ourselves as the more advanced species on this planet, but as it relates to nature, as that relates to the innate ability to survive, animals have us surpassed in that way. And so that's why, you know, people always ask me, what's it like working with wildlife? And I'm like, look, they're the worst actors. They never show up on time. And when they finally do, they want to eat each other. There's no union. So I don't know how you're supposed to work under those conditions. However, they're the greatest subjects. So with that, I'll get into a little bit of images here. And you guys will see a mix and mash of wildlife because I chose these animals as they can reflect getting back to the issue of monarchs. So let's dive right into this little video. Am I sharing my screen here with you guys? Sorry, I'm getting a call. <laughs> um, they're trying to kick me out of my hotel room, but they won't kick me out before the presentation's done. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen with you. Can you guys see that? Yes. Awesome, okay. So, I'm lucky enough to live in one of the most beautiful places on earth. In Costa Rica, it's about 130,000 kilometers, roughly the size of West Virginia. Every single night, the sea swallows the sun and spits it back out into a thousand diamonds in the sky. As I mentioned, we've got about 4% of the earth's biodiversity. We're surrounded by volcanoes. We've got over 50 species of hummingbirds and we have five of the world's seven species of sea turtles that come to nest on Costa Rica's beaches. You can see countless aggregations of up to 10,000 spinner dolphins, adibadas, which is where sea turtles mass synchronize their nesting period. And then the smartest primates, in my opinion, the capuchin monkeys. So my obsession with capturing these images, with taking people around the world, is to show them the things that I get to see on almost a daily basis, as I mentioned, to prepare that stoke. So I made my name as a Nat Geo photographer by getting close to wildlife. Here you can see a great hammerhead that I photographed in Bahamas, a capuchin monkey that caught an iguana and bit the head off right in front of me to remind me that again, they're the most capable primates on this planet. And I'm obsessed with dolphins because when you think about monarchs, Dolphins kind of play the same role in the water where it's easy to get people involved and interested in conservation. So the reason I'm obsessed with monarchs and, and why I love pollinators is because, as I mentioned before, everything can play its role in nature, but it's also an easy animal to get invigorated and stoked on as it comes to conservation. It's something that we can all point our finger to. We can remember when we saw a monarch. We can remember how it made us feel with seeing a postcard-like animal such as the monarch. So when you think about creating images in my space, what I try to do is use technology to reveal a side of nature that we've never seen. So one of the things I like to do is take super slow motion cameras and show animals as they pop against their background. So here you can see a red-eyed tree frog, which these animals remind me of monarchs because they use startle coloration. 
They bulge out their red eyes, making a would-be predator think that they're venomous, and that deters them from feeding on them, much like how the monarch uses its coloration to make a would-be predator think that it's poisonous. Here you can see a blue morpho butterfly emerging from its chrysalis and then taking its maiden flight. You can see a neotropical rattlesnake breathing in slow motion versus breathing in normal speed. And again, this is a camera that allows us to take one second and turn it into two and a half minutes. And so the human eye sees closer to 24 frames a second. And this camera can shoot up to 3000 frames a second. So when you apply technology to the animals in that and that we find in nature, you can really show them popping against their natural environment and highlight some of the skill sets that they have. A hummingbird, much like a monarch, it's highly responsible for breathing life into everything that it comes into contact with, that little bit of dandruff that you see on the pollen there that's gonna be shared amongst other hummingbirds and butterflies. And every time they do a shimmy, they shake all that pollen off and again, breathe life into everything that they come into contact with. This is a bark scorpion. I found this one in my bed. When you put it uh, <laughs> under a glow light, it, under a dark light, it glows in the dark. And yeah, again, you know, lucky me, I found it in my bed. When you light a tree frog from above, you can see its internal organs. And then you can see it jumping away to freedom in super slow motion. So if there's any photographers, if there's any videographers sitting here, the reason why I'm putting these images up is because I want to challenge you guys to think about right now how technology has caught up to a point where we can now have every single tool in our availability to say, if I want to tell a story, if I want to get other people excited about what I have in my backyard, it's no longer the excuse of if I only had this, I could do this. Now technology has caught up to creativity and we can achieve whatever it is that we want through images. And so that's why applying even macro technology, you can really highlight the intrinsic value that these animals have. And as I mentioned before about startle coloration, making would-be predators think that an animal is venomous, when you're a monarch butterfly and you only have a wingspan of around four inches and you weigh what, uh, less than a gram, is that correct? <laughs> um, less than half a gram, you really have to use everything at your disposal in order to survive. So as a filmmaker, and when you see the caterpillar in this sense, I mean, this quarter for scale, this is what these animals have to deal with. So using images to show how challenging it is to make it as a monarch, but not just how beautiful they are, but how challenging it is for a monarch to survive in today's world. And so we often think of pollinators as such, you know, capable animals because we know that they can cover great distances. But just to show you what they have to deal with on a daily basis, this is one image I caught of a pollinator. This is a Telemanca hummingbird. Have you ever been hit so hard that you've literally had the pee knocked out of you? Like this is what this poor hummingbird has to go through just to take a sip of nectar. So again, I put this in there to remind, and I'm gonna show you guys that again, in case if you missed it, just to say, take a single sip of nectar, a single sip. This poor female Talamanca hummingbird literally gets the pee knocked out of her. So when you think about how capable these animals are, and how nature has designed them to be perfectly suited to thrive in their natural environments, they're often the ones challenging themselves. So it's competition that has made these animals great. And as Darwin said, it's not the biggest, it's not the strongest, it's not the smartest, but it's the species most capable perfectly suited they are so for butter transition so this is something that i filmed for national geographic on species in costa rica but it's something that we would like to replicate in the united states for species like the monarch and what we can find in our own backyard 
But using technology, using images to get people to care is to play on empathy. So we protect what we love, we love what we understand, and we understand what we are taught. So again, I'm always going to bring it back to the filmmaker's role, to the photographer's role, to the naturalist's role that's sitting here and listening here. If you feel like you care about these animals, then you definitely have a responsibility to ask yourself how you can show them in a new way and how you can play to empathy to get people to care. Because even the monarch, even an animal as idealistic as 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 you know, postcard like status as this beautiful creature is up against its challenges. And when you think about the fact that they're the official state insect of five US states, you know, they're incredibly resourceful. They can eat their own shed skin. Even the caterpillar will eat its egg. You know, that's a lesson for all of us. How resourceful can we be? How much better can we get at preserving our own backyard? The monarch is the perfect, I would like to call gateway animal for getting into conservation. Why? Because it's such a safe, it's such a compatible animal to our own backyard that we can correlate with our own existence. And it's something that is incredibly easy to get the next generation doped on. So one of the things that going on. And one of the things that I want to inspire, you know, I know we have a large calendar, environmental education. When we think about the kids being the future, I honestly couldn't disagree with that statement more because I believe that the youth is the now. Think about the resources that they have available fingertips, whether it's phone, to learn things in real time. I believe it's up to our generation, everybody sitting here on this webinar right now to ask themselves how not only can we create images, how can we tell about better stories to get people to empathize, but how do we provide this generation with the tools to inherit a planet that will preserve nature and allow nature to create sustainable ecosystems for them down the road? Because as I mentioned earlier, the monarch has to make a migration of around 3,000 miles per year. When you think about coming into defragmented habitat and feeding grounds, that's a lot of food and a lot of resources that it's going to be lacking from one year to the next if we don't have this ambassador animal to get us to do a few responsible things. So one of the ways that you can get involved in conservation through the monarch right now is to plant native flowers. I promise you guys, you can draw in hummingbirds, you can draw in other you know, species by using artificial tools like feeders, but that should be the gateway for then the evolution of that attraction, which is to plant native flowers. Because again, while they're there making that migration, most of these animals are gonna remember the most viable food sources along the way. So if your house, if your hosting spot is one of these viable food resources, then guess what? They're going to come and pay a visit next year. They don't have to have a membership through you guys. They don't have to call in ahead of time and make sure, you know, there's nobody checked out the reservation spot. If you plant native flowers, if you create your backyard, your host spot as an attraction for these animals to come and do what they do, then guess what? You benefit, they benefit and the nature around you benefits, which intrinsically means that future generations will benefit. So to get active in conservation right now, rather than cursing the darkness, light one candle, tell your friends about the adventures, about the beauty that you're having in your backyard as you're photographing or filming these animals on the phone, posting it to social media. Remember a couple of key phrases, plant native, preserve, and make sure that you're sharing the stoke. Nature is meant to be shared by the people that love it. So as we're facing all these challenging times in conservation, as we're going through, you know, all this insecurity about what the future lies as it relates to nature, make sure that you're planting a seed of hope. And rather than cursing the darkness, you're lighting a candle. I couldn't be more grateful to share 
what I do with a community of people that care. That's the absolute best part about my job. After being in the water with sharks or being in the jungle with the jaguar or chasing monarchs in Mexico, I would rather be doing nothing else than sitting here sharing these images with you guys and hearing about your own adventures. So thank you guys for having me on. If you ever want to visit me in Costa Rica, if you've got a host spot where you have native flowers and you've got monarchs in your backyard, send me a digital carrier pigeon, send me a smoke signal, and I'll make sure to RSVP. Thank you guys so much for having me on. And I can't wait to learn something today. Wow, thank you so much, Felipe. That was really great. What amazing footage and pictures you shared. Thank you so much. Um, our next speaker is Matthew Shepard. Matthew is from the Xerxes Society. He's going to give us an update on the monarch migration and where they are and why this monarch migration is so incredible. Go ahead, Matthew. Great. Well, thank you so much. And of course, I, I, I have the tough spot of having to follow all that, that amazing footage and beautiful photos there. So um, I'm going to share my screen as well. And... Hopefully this will work out for you all. That should work. Um, but yeah, so, I mean, thank you, Felipe, for, for what you were just saying there. I couldn't agree more with you about the importance of sharing the word and, you know, being excited about, about what you're doing. Um, I work with lots of different um, individuals and groups, and I, I find that one of the one of the best things they can do is yeah they everybody wants to do something and so they're so focused on on the action on the planting on the planning on the next step but people forget to sit down and just watch um, just take time to enjoy what has been created and seeing the the monarchs or the bumblebees or you know whatever it is what the, the wildlife that you're now um, attracting into your into your patch of land um, and there's so much that we can learn from from watching and observing um, part of which is just I mean is what we're doing the right thing? You know, what works, what doesn't for that patch of land? And I know Ray is following me and he'll have lots of great information to share about, you know, some of the, the real practical steps you can be taking. Um, I've got a few minutes now to give you a, a kind of a snapshot of what monarchs are doing at the moment. Um, and I mean, as we were hearing there, the huge traveler, um, they can travel more than 2,500, maybe 3,000 miles for some of them. Um, and at the moment, as, as we sit here, um, we really are looking at the end of the journey. Um, they are moving from this area, across this, I don't know how many millions of square miles of the continent that they colonize um, through the spring and summer and returning to the overwintering. Um, monarchs can't survive in most of the United States or, you know, they do get into southern Canada, which is about as far as milkweed goes. And basically the winters are too cold um, and they won't survive. So they have to head somewhere else to survive the winter. Um, and it's incredible, this, this generation of, of butterflies, and we typically think of butterflies as being short-lived things. Um, you know, it, during the summer, the total time from you know from hatching to death is a, is a few weeks but this late summer generation stops developing and they don't reach reproductive condition until the end of winter and so they could live for six or eight months um, as we're hearing yes they do weigh less than half a gram they weigh about one fiftieth of an ounce um, we, I, you know, it's like that's so small. We, I don't know if we would even notice that weight if it was sitting on our hand. Four inch wingspan. They live for months and they can fly thousands of miles. Um, what a remarkable animal. The reason why they're flying is, yes, they're looking for somewhere where they can survive the winter. But we, we are frequently think of migrants as going somewhere warm. Um, for the for the monarchs, they're looking for somewhere that's not necessarily warm, but it's cool and stable, but not freezing. Um, if they could survive freezing, they would probably stay in Minnesota or Ontario or wherever, but they can't survive that, so they have to go somewhere else. And so they're looking for an area that will provide shelter from, from the worst of the weather, um, provides them with this 
as I say, with this cool but stable temperature. Um, for the temperature, butterflies, they, they're not like mammals, they don't generate their own, own heat. So it takes an external temperature for them to be active. And about 55 degrees Fahrenheit, they can fly. Um, between about 40 degrees and 55 degrees Fahrenheit, they can crawl. Um, and so they're looking for these cool conditions where their metabolism slows down um, and they can, can survive the winter. Most of the sites that we have in, in California are within about a mile and a half of either the ocean or the San Francisco Bay. Um, the closer to the water, the, 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 the water stabilizes and moderates the, the, the temperature and so they get fewer fluctuations. Um, they say they, they are looking for shelter from winter and storms. And this, this photograph um, shows an overwintering site. In, in This is one is in Santa Cruz. And you see, these are not necessarily distant wilderness locations. They'll be right there in your, in your neighborhood. Um, but they're not looking for big sites, but a place where it provides just those right kind of shelter and temperature conditions. They need water to stop them from, from drying out during the year. They like dappled sunshine. That helps them maintain the temperature, they don't want it to be too warm. You know, if it gets too hot, then their metabolism speeds up and they, they use up um, their, their body resources. And so, the, but they, the warmth, bit of sunshine allows them to hit that magic 55 degree um, temperature. And then they can fly and they'll be able to go find the nectar, um, find the water, um, but are able to um, conserve their resources. Um, because they are essentially living on, on the fats, the lipids in their body for most of that, that time. Um, the other thing that's really significant about overwintering is that it's the only time of year when we have any chance of being able to accurately estimate the population size because the butterflies are in one place, or in California, about 400 places, but still gathered and there's a chance to count them and estimate. Um, otherwise, you're trying to count you know, tiny animals across huge area of land. Um, and so this, this winter population um, and those aggregations, the reason why we are able to say there are, you know, X many monarchs remaining. In the West, um, the, the monarchs from the Western states and that's as far north as into British Columbia, um, they head towards the California coast. Um, from about Humboldt south. Um, and it does get all the way down into Mexico. But there all these sites along the, the California coast. Um, and it's while they're there that, that, that we're able to estimate. And to give you an idea of what's happening now, and I've got these figures and they're updated just yesterday. Um, so far, it's really encouraging. Um, there's about 60,000 monarchs that have been um, counted in a number, a roughly 30 sites, um, and this is not the, the full count, but to give you an idea, in Santa Cruz we have about 10,000 monarchs so far, Pacific Grove about 11,000, and further south at Pismo there's about 30,000. Um, and these are really encouraging, but we know that we have a long way to go yet. But the thing that's most encouraging about this is actually that number from Santa Cruz, because last year, Santa Cruz and northwards from there had almost no overwintering monarchs. They were all in the southern part of the state. So the fact that they're, they're returning to those sites is, is really good news. So that you, you have a bit of a longer term context. This is a, a chart that shows the, the numbers in California um, over the last 25 years. And back in 1997, which is the first time that there was an organized count, there was close to one and a quarter million butterflies. Two years ago, that had crashed all the way down to 2000. And then last winter, there was um, more than 200,000. And at the moment, we're looking more like we're going to be at or above that 200,000, maybe, you know, a quarter of a million. Um, and you can see for the, that blue line that zigzags its way up, that you can see over the, over the years, more sites have been discovered where monarchs are over winter. And so more sites have been monitored. And that's why you can see why these last few years have been just so depressing. Um, because 
the number of sites that have been been um, visited and where butterflies have been searched for has gone up and up and up and up, but the numbers of butterflies have gone down. And broader context, back in the 1980s, um, the, the best estimations of numbers of monarchs from then are about 4 million. So since then, the monarchs in, in California, the Western population have gone down and now we're looking at, you know, only a 95% loss. Um, at one point, a couple of years ago, it was looking more like a 99% loss. But it's the, this Western monarch Thanksgiving count, which has allowed us to have the most accurate figures. Um, it's volunteers, they're trained, consistent protocols, so everybody uses the same technique to, to estimate. And this year's count actually starts um, this coming weekend. It's a period of wrap about three weeks centered upon Thanksgiving. And so um, by January, we should have a more accurate idea of just how many monarchs there are in California. The population from the east is much bigger than, than the population in the west. And this is the one that, um, I mean, Ray has the good fortune of living right underneath the migration route. Um, and this is the one that, you know, so many people are aware of because this is the population that heads down and ends up in, in Mexico. Um, there is also uh, in um, Florida, there's a population that doesn't migrate. Um, and the, the monarchs, in fact, you get monarchs in, in, in the Caribbean, um, Central America and into South America. Um, and there may be some movement between Florida and Cuba, for example, but a lot of these questions we just don't know. Um, for a, such a beloved and high profile, well-known insect, um, there are still a lot of questions we don't have answers to. But this Eastern population has moved south towards Mexico. Um, from September, it started heading down and most of the population has now moved into Mexico and has actually started reaching the, the sites in um, central Mexico. And so the, their arrival time is associated with the Day of the Dead celebrations. Um, and now the, the monarch butterflies are, are, are seen as returning souls coming back for that. And this year, the first reports were actually on November 2nd, which was Day of the Dead. So the timing was spot on, but we're still waiting for the bulk of the butterflies to reach that the overwintering sites. And as you know, there's still some in Texas, Alabama, along the Gulf Coast. And again, some of these things we don't know, and it may just be shifting climate, but we may be getting gr um, greater numbers of butterflies that are now overwintering um, in some of those southern coastal areas. And this is the chart for the population in, in Mexico. Um, these numbers come from um, a group of um, agencies and nonprofits that have been coordinated by World Wildlife Fund in Mexico. And they estimate the population by measuring the area of forest that's filled by butterflies. Um, and these figures are the area in hectares. Um, which if you don't convert hectares, if you're in California, in Canada, you know this, um, maybe Charles knows this now, now that he's in Norway, but a hectare is about two and a half acres. Um, so that, that figure of 2.84 is just a little over six acres. Um, and that represents several million. But again, it's really encouraging to have these better numbers and maybe we'll have have more than that this year, but it's still like an 80% plus decline over the, over the last few decades in the number of monarchs. And so um, we're all, obviously we're all hoping for good news um, from, from this year, but it's gonna be months until we know. Um, WWF Mexico normally announces in February. Last year it was May. Strangely, it got caught up in, in the Mexican election. They didn't want to make any official pronouncements until after the election. Um, but hopefully, fingers crossed, we'll, we'll know by February where that population stands. Just wrapping up, I mean, this again can, takes us back to what Felipe was saying, monarchs connect us. You saw that map that Charles showed of all the hip camp locations. Um, and so all those sites, I mean, 
all of us, we have the possibility to make some space for monarchs. It could be big, it could be small. You might have 10 acres, you might have 10 square feet. It doesn't really matter. We can all be doing something. It could be in, in gardens, um, you know, urban, suburban areas. It could be natural areas. We could be transforming agricultural landscapes, bringing habitat back in, um, drawing the nature back into those areas and supporting the monarchs. Because it doesn't matter whether it's a few milkweed plants that are essential to feed the caterpillars um, as they're breeding and gradually moving north through the spring and the summer. It could be nectar plants that fuel the adults whilst they're breeding and in particular whilst they're flying. Imagine a you know, a, a half gram insect flying 2000 miles, they, they need to stop in the same way that if we were driving, we would stop and refuel. So nectar plants through the summer, in particular in late summer to support that migration, because monarchs really do truly connect us. Every one of us here have a chance to do something that will re recreate the habitat that the, these butterflies need across these vast distances that, that, that they require. Um, it seems like such a tiny, uh, a fragile, and yet remarkably resilient and powerful animal. Um, and every one of us here can be doing something. We don't have to do everything incremental steps. You don't have to go, goodness, I should do this whole project in one day. You, you don't. You can just take, take that first step, um, make that initial change, and then gradually, gradually change things. And then hopefully, eventually, we'll be back into be, have skies filled with monarchs again. So thank you. Thank you, Matthew. All right. Last but not least, we have our speaker, Ray, who is going to be digging into all things monarch butterfly um, best practices on a large acreage and working landscapes. So Ray, take it away. Okay, uh, I know I need to put it into display mode. Let's hit the button, let's make it happen. Okay, how's it looking? Still seeing it not in display. Oh, now we're good. Good. Okay, folks. Um, well, Felipe talked about being extremely stoked about taking videos and photos, and I am too, um, on a much more amateurish level. I don't know if you can see this. <laughs> you can't, but that's one tricky thing. I've been taking photos and videos lately and posting them on Instagram of monarchs and other pollinators. I'm getting like 24,000 views and stuff, which is a thrill. Uh, certainly, that's something that y'all y'all can do at your camps. Uh, but what I, my, what I really focus on is creating habitat. So I'm gonna talk about that. Um, the four foci of this segment, uh, and I'm gonna have to skip number four because I just made this presentation too long. Uh, so I'll really focus on one, two, three. Small scale plantings, large scale removal of undesirable vegetation and large scale, large scale plantings and habitat. So we'll start with a small scale. Can your campground make a difference for monarchs? Absolutely. A single milkweed plant can make a difference. This is a photo of a single butterfly milkweed plant. Uh, uh, and you can see that monarch caterpillar is quite happy. Uh, it's quite large, just about large enough to pupate. So yeah, a single milkweed can make a difference. Um, female monarchs are amazingly good at finding a single milkweed in a large grassland. Uh, their chemosensory abilities are amazing. Feel free to start small. And this is an example of something, uh, a way that I started small. Uh, this is our mailbox and around our mailbox are some nectar plants. These nectar plants would cost you about $2 worth of seeds. And yet these nectar plants have fed literally thousands of pollinators this growing season. Uh, hundreds of butterflies, uh, including monarchs. So yeah, a little bit can go a long way. You can't do that with bald eagles. You, you know, you can't you can't create bald eagle habitat on a five five foot by ten foot area, but you can create monarch habitat on a tiny area. Of course, uh, as you know, monarch caterpillars only feed on milkweeds, so you need to provide milkweeds. Well, where do you find them? How do you know which milkweeds you plant? Please consider searching the internet for these guides, the Xerxes 
Society uh, roadside milkweed guides. We have them for just about every region of the country. Uh, and so the search term would be um, Xerxes roadside milkweeds. And I actually could copy them into the, the website, into the chat box, if I could figure out how, how to get back in the chat box. But uh, I, I think that's a little more than I can handle technologically. Uh, okay, the adults need nectar. How do you know what nectar plants to provide them? Well, search for our regional monarch nectar plant guides. And um, we've got them for every region of the country. They have about 25 species of plants in each guide and tips on how to grow them. Pretty, pretty easy. You wanna provide a, ideally a, a variety of, of species. I just showed you one species at my mailbox earlier. That species happens to bloom for many months, but ideally you will have species that bloom all the way from early spring until the very end of the fall. And to do that, you need a, a diversity of species, some spring bloomers, summer bloomers, fall bloomers. Please focus on native plants to the best of your ability. I'll confess, I grow some exotic plants like tomatoes and uh, what else is exotic in my garden? Apple trees and things like that. Um, but I, I avoid the, ex the invasive exotics where I can. This, this plant here is the photo I took in the Florida Panhandle this spring. And there were literally thousands of these lining a beautiful stream on a 10,000 acre parcel. This 10,000 acre property is loaded with endangered species, but this invasive plant is gonna make it harder for those endangered species to survive. So please try not to plant problems. Point of this slide is to, is to point out that when you go to a nursery, ask before you buy, ask them what they're putting on the plants because the second and third authors here, uh, co-workers of Matthew and I, conducted this research project in which they discovered that milkweed plants bought from nurseries at various states around the US, a large proportion of them had high levels of toxins in the foliage. So high that if you brought these plants home, there's a good chance you're gonna poison the monarch caterpillars. So please be careful in what you buy. And of course, avoid using insecticides wherever possible, uh, particularly neo, neonics, neonicotinoid insecticides, which are particularly uh, dangerous because they're systemic. Okay, now let's quickly move on to large scale plantings. Oh, I'm sorry, large, large scale removal of unwanted vegetation. And at this point, it becomes time to think a little bigger. Um, and I need to get rid of the video, good. So, Try to figure out what ecosystems you have at your campsite, at your campground. What invasive plants do you have? And what ecosystems do you want to have? And if you feel you need help with us, with answering these questions, consider contacting this, if you're in the US, this agency, the NRCS, which is a subunit of the USDA. They have 11,000 employees. Yes, 11,000. They're in almost every county of the US and they help primarily farmers and ranchers. But even if you're not a farmer and rancher, they can provide you technical assistance. They can provide you advice on uh, what ecosystems you have and, and, and what you could do to improve them. And to find the NRCS webs, uh, folks in your area, please do a search for USDA Service Center. Once again, USDA Service Center. You go to that website, you find this map. You click on your state. Once you click on your state, click on your county. Once you've clicked on your county, you're gonna be given contact information of the people to, to contact. Does Canada have something like this to the folks in Quebec? No, I do think, I think you do not because I was at a meeting a few years ago with an amazing Canadian wildlife conservationist and, and she told me that no, Canada didn't have anything anywhere near this comprehensive for, for helping uh, landowners. Hopefully I'm wrong about that. But in the US, please contact the NRCS to get help with um, figuring out what ecosystems you have and what soils you have and, and whatnot. This is a photo of our land and the NRCS 
told me that, hey, you've got some native prairie, that's good. Uh, but you also have a lot of um, cedar forest, which is problematic. This is the cedar forest in my area. What you see here shouldn't be here. During the times of, of native, dominate, native American um, you know, ownership of Oklahoma, this was prairie. But since um, Europeans arrived, the cedars have taken over. And when you have a lot of cedars like this, you don't have much of anything else. Very few flowers, very few pollinators. It's very unpleasant to walk through. It's not very pleasant for campers either. So uh, we actually got some assistance from our, a county agency uh, to help chop down some tree, some cedar trees. But quickly I realized that I was gonna need more help because we had thousands of the, over a thousand of these trees. Uh, and so um, they pitched in and helped cover the cost of large machinery and somebody to run it to help remove large amounts of invasive cedar trees. Um, an even bigger example in Southern Oklahoma, this fellow had 1700 acres on his ranch with cattle, but lots and lots of cedars. So the NRCS provided funding so he could rent bulldozers. They demolished the cedars. It looked like hell, but then they burned them up. And after they burned, they got an amazing flush of really hundreds of thousands of milkweeds and nectar sources. So it became amazing uh, monarch habitat, and it also became amazing for, uh, for the rancher, because now he had a lot more grass and a lot more wildflowers. Cattle eat grass and wildflowers. They don't eat cedar trees. So it was a win-win, both for the monarchs and for the ranching business. Okay, my next segment, large-scale plantings. I wanna direct you to this guide produced by the Xerces Society. This is a free download, so please consider taking a photo of this or typing it in quickly. Again, I wish I had these in the chat box for you, links to these. That would have been the way to go, I apologize. Establishing pollinator meadows from seed is a very pithy explanation of how to do it. Um, normally I would spend a whole hour on this topic, on telling you how to do this. I'm gonna cover this in about four or five minutes. That's why I'm, I'm directing you to this publication. Um, but some, another publication I think you should try to obtain is this one and search for Xerces Organic Site Preparation. Once again, Xerces Organic Site Preparation, because this gives you tips on how to prepare your land before the planting in non-chemical ways. And it's so important because if you just go out in your landscape right now, on your campground right now, and throw down a, a lot of native uh, wildflower seeds, they're probably not gonna do well because they're probably gonna suffer from the competition of the weeds or other plants that are already there. So you need to prepare the ground first. And one way to do this, now here's a whole set. Uh, there are like seven different methods. I'm gonna skip to this one, solarization. You get a giant sheet of plastic, ideally clear plastic or white plastic, cover the area that you want to become habitat. You're gonna be doing this in spring, summer, or fall. And then you're trying to cook the soil so that you're killing weed seeds or you're convincing weed seeds to germinate and then you're cooking the seedlings. So solarization is a organic means of preparing the ground for planting habitat. Very tried and true method. Okay, what do you, what do you want to plant there? Once again, to figure out what species you need, please find our regional monarch nectar plant guides. Please avoid mass produced seed mixes. Big box stores, uh, all kinds of stores will sell wildflower seed mixes. And the pictures on the front will be very pretty. But when you look at this one, for instance, we see that it's got purple coneflower, which is from the Ozarks, 
California poppy, which is from California, uh, Shasta daisy, which is a hybrid from three different continents. This doesn't really belong anywhere in the US or, or anywhere else for that matter, because it's full of exotic plants. Wherever you planted this, it would have lots of exotics. So please avoid mass produced mixes and instead contact a local grower who grows native wildflowers and buy a customized mix. I know the prices on the right may seem sort of high. They're actually species that cost a lot more than this, but please note, this is price per pound. So with a pound of Biden Zerostosa seed, you, you could plant a, a very large area, perhaps as large as a, as a half acre of, of monarch habitat. And some examples of plantings that, that I've been a part of uh, on our land. Um, I, I did these, I seeded this habitat in February of 2019. And a few months later, it was pretty gorgeous and it had monarchs and other pollinators. This is a seeding that I did in winter of 2020. And seven months later, it was looking pretty good. Uh, this is along our catfish pond. So seed, if, once again, once you go to larger areas, you don't wanna buy plants, you wanna buy seed, you wanna buy a native seed mix, but they are, uh, they are very effective. You know what? I think you can keep going, Ray, if you'd like to. I think we have an excellent. Time. I've I've talked fast. I'll still be a little over twenty, but uh, I'll talk briefly, and I'll skip a few slides on managing habitat. Um, I want to talk first about prescribed fire. I did my PhD research on the effects of fire and grazing on butterflies, so I'm really into this topic, and I know that fire can harm butterflies. Um, especially the eggs and the larvae and the pupae because they can't escape fire. Even adults, if they're hiding in the vegetation in wintertime, you can burn them up. However, even though I know that, this is a fire that I did on my land, on our land, about a year ago today. Um, and uh, yes, we had plenty of people there to help keep it safe. Why do I do the burning even though I know I'm killing some butterflies? Because I know that I'm improving the habitat overall in the long run and sometimes in the very quick run as well. Because fire has many benefits. It helps grassland areas stay grasslands. It helps keep our woodlands open. It keeps them from coming really, really dense. Actually makes them less fire prone, less likely to suffer from horrible wild, wildfires. Uh, and I'm going to skip to this last point. It really increases blooming of multiple wildflower species. These are photos I took from prairie in Missouri. Both of these prairies had just been burned about three months earlier. My research showed that fire greatly stimulated the flower production of these plants. And that's going to be true in many ecosystems of the US and Canada. Um, I'm going to talk about a best uh, management practice, please burn more. If you're going to do prescribed burning, don't burn your whole property or don't, you know, don't burn a, burn a huge area because you might wipe out a population of pollinator. Instead, burn a third per year uh, so that if the fire is doing any harm to some creatures, you're not wiping out a population. They're, they're surviving in the two thirds of the land that you didn't, that you didn't burn. Another photo of fire at our place, just to show you that, um, yes, I know it can be dangerous, but I know it can be done safely near homes. That's my house there in the background. It can be done safely in campgrounds uh, with a lot of forethought and plenty of help. I'm gonna skip the section on grazing because I'm guessing that uh, it's not so relevant to most of this crew. Quickly talk about chemical weed control. If you do use chemicals, of course, don't spray your native forbs. Um, and skipping to point number three, avoid broadcast applications, use targeted applications. Um, we don't know what these chemicals are gonna do in the long run, we really don't. There's been research done on them, but we're still not sure what's gonna happen. So use, if you use herbicides, 
use them very carefully to primarily to get out uh, noxious, uh, noxious invasive plants. I'm gonna skip this for sure. Oh dear, that wasn't so sad. Okay. There weren't many more slides to cover. I think I will go right to this. <laughs> um, sorry about that. Somehow I uh, got out of the presentation. So please consider contacting Matthew or I if you have detailed questions about planting monarch habitat or managing land for monarchs and other pollinators. If we can't answer your questions, we have coworkers all over the US and now one in Canada who can, who can help you. Um, this is our job. We love to do this. So please feel free to research, to, to reach out to Matthew and I to talk about uh, monarchs, other pollinators, other invertebrates and, and how to conserve them. Thank you very much for your time. And if you all have questions, I, uh, I'm sure uh, we'd love to address them. That was great, Ray. Thank you so much. Um, we are at Q&A time now. So we had a couple questions come in ahead of time, but anyone who's still with us, um, feel free to drop a question in the chat here and we'll get to them in order. Um, some that came in ahead of time, are there grants available to create large pollinator fields? Um, Ray or Matthew, do you have any info on that? Yes, I do. Uh, and yes, there are. Um, let's see. The, the NRCS, that federal agency in the US that I mentioned earlier, um, they do provide cost share to landowners to create pollinator habitat. Uh, it is a federal agency. There's gonna be paperwork to fill out. There's no guarantee that you qualify, but it is worth a try. And guess what? This same federal agency is providing money to me and my wife to do this. We're gonna do a uh, planting in about three weeks, uh, creating about a, maybe, a, maybe a third of an acre of pollinator habitat. Um, I think um, I pay, we're paying half of the cost, they're paying the other half of the cost. So NRCS is a source, the US Fish and Wildlife Service is a source of funds for this. The, uh, your state agencies, wildlife agencies might help. And then the Xerces Society in some parts of the US has plant kits, uh, plant kit programs. So that's a possibility. We, we give away free plants. And then Monarch Watch, once again, Monarch Watch in Kansas gives away free plants, uh, mainly in the central US, the northeastern US, and California. They give away free milkweeds. Excellent. Thank you. All right, another question we had come in. When is the best time of year to mow meadows in preparation for planting milkweed and other food, food sources? Best time of year to mow meadows. Um, the, the best time to plant is usually, well, it depends if it's seeds. The best time to plant seeds is usually late fall and winter uh, or late winter. So if that's the case, you, you could mow your area, um, you know, anytime in late fall, but, if you're gonna, if you already have a meadow of some sort and you're gonna be planting seeds, the seeds aren't gonna have that much of a shot of making it if the meadow vegetation is still there. Even if it's been mowed, um, it's possible that it can make it. And we have some guidelines on doing that, but it would be better to get rid of the meadow veg vegetation first. If on the other hand, you're just uh, planting some transplants into the meadow. Um, yeah, you would just wanna mow a few weeks or a couple months before you do the planting. Um, uh, but you're gonna want to, of course, uh, create some bare ground around your, 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 where you plant your plants so that there's less competition. Uh, the part of my talk talked about solarization 
And the whole point of solarization is to get rid of any plants that's already there. The plants that are already there compete with whatever you're trying to plant. So we usually recommend trying to get rid of plants that are already there. If the plants you are, have already there are good native plants, then by all means, don't get rid of those. Excellent, thank you. Um, before I do the next question, I wanna encourage if anyone has had any uh, success in attracting pollinators or monarchs, feel free to drop your, you know, your ideas and knowledge in the chat there for other hosts to um, learn from you. So another question, do monarchs migrate in the sky islands in the Southwest like ladybugs, or do they typically remain in the lower elevations? And are they attracted to riparian water like migrating hummingbirds in the San Pedro River Valley that head that head waters to Mexico? Um, I feel like Matthew might have some thoughts on this. Um, yeah, um, although Ray may actually be better or at Ray, answering yeah. this, but I, I have thoughts on many things, but um, <laughs> specifically with the Sky Islands, um, I'm sure the monarchs will be passing through those areas, but I mean, mostly when monarchs are migrating, they do use landforms and landmarks you know that that's how they're guided so you know sometimes it's it's mountains sometimes it's valleys that they're, they're following um and so i mean i don't know whether they use the sky island specifically um but they certainly pass through that area and i, I mean because as they're migrating they um they do pause uh, overnight you know you find these these um uh daily roosts where they will sometimes gather um and some those are i mean i would think the sky islands are a, a likely place for them to roost um they're more likely to go into the mountains um and to the you know the, the shelter there rather than necessarily straight out in the surrounding desert areas um do they use river valleys yeah they they will also follow river valleys um, as one, as part of the the landmark that they're going through and but again those would be more um, you know moderated climate um, conditions where they'd like to roost um, they may well find in some of the you know particularly if you're in an area like the Sky Islands where um, vegetation may be more closely tied to water. Um, water is where they're likely to find the nectar as well, the, or at least the nectar plants growing in those riparian areas. So, but yeah, Ray, I don't know if you have anything you want to add to that. I, I want to add that I, I agree with that very much, Matthew. I will. Uh, Scott is from northern New Mexico, and from my review of the literature, we understand migration through New Mexico less well than just about any other state. So this, this, is, this is in great need of research, but, but I certainly think they probably, I agree with Matthew, they almost certainly use the riparian zones uh, because they very much do that in South Texas, um, almost, almost exclusively once um, they, they hit the, the, because there's so many more nectar plants uh, along the right uh, along the rivers of, of central and south Texas than there are anywhere else. So, so uh, yes, they're that's, they're probably doing that. Excellent, um, Felipe. Can you tell us a little bit about um, what an umbrella species is and why, when we protect monarchs, we protect a bunch of other species as well? That's a great question. So umbrella species, as I was referring to it in the talk is, you know, one of these animals, like again, whether you look at keystone species in biology, we think of dolphins, we think of predators as keystone species because they tend to have such like a trickle down impact on their ecosystem when a jaguar feeds on something that produces food for so many countless other species. However, when a monarch pollinates that prov provides food source, provides clean oxygen, provides habitat for so many other species. So when we look at a keystone species, it's in terms of like their relative impact within their environment and how that benefits other animals. But as an umbrella species of conservation, I also use the term gateway, you know, like they're truly, the monarchs are a gateway for conservation. And, and to become a naturalist because it, it stokes and lights a fire 
that could then bud into a beautiful passion. So the monarch is such an identifiable animal, making it an umbrella species, because if you get curious about monarchs, then guess what? You're going to get curious about birds. And if you get curious about birds, then you're going to get curious about other insects and then maybe mammals. And then you're going to find yourself at different elevations whether it's in the mountains, whether it's on the coastline, or then whether you make your way out into the ocean. I've seen butterflies in the open ocean. I don't know how the hell that's possible. I showed you guys images of sharks and dolphins before. Yes, I've been in the middle of nowhere in the Bahamas looking for tiger sharks and have seen butterflies. I've been in the Gulf of Mexico and have seen hummingbirds and monarchs. So these animals you know, they truly transcend their environment. And when they go across other environments, the reason they're umbrella species is because they can take you to different ecosystems. I harp on this phrase a lot. It's called worth more alive. And it's putting a value to nature, both, you know, intrinsically and monetarily. When we value something, again, we protect it, but we lean into what makes us curious about that thing. So the monarch is a great place to start if you're getting interested in nature, if you have friends or family or kids or loved ones or parents, rather, that you want to get interested in nature. Start with the monarch, you know, really like take them to see this beautiful animal where you know that they are, whether it's a, you know, pollinator garden, whether you know where they're stopping off to feed along their migrational points. If, if you want to get somebody interested in nature, Take them to see a monarch. It's an easy animal to photograph, to be around, to film, to identify with, to see as they're in their natural environment, and then watch that spark in curiosity, but into a greater curiosity. And soon you may have a naturalist in your backyard. You may have a friend that you can go on adventures with. So as it relates to umbrella species, they protect everything that they come with for ambassador ask questions being a naturalist being a biologist being a photographer being a you know being a person involved with nature it means to remain curious so for every question that you answer a hundred new ones come up and that's what makes the butterfly, that's what makes the monarch such a great umbrella species, because you can never ask too many questions. There's always another one around the corner. Love that. Thank you so much, Felipe. Um, let's see if I don't see any more questions right now in the chat. Um, if anyone has any last minute ones they want to get out, feel free to drop it in right now. Um, Otherwise, I'm going to hand it back over to Charles here to close us out. Awesome. Thank you, Remy. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you, Felipe. Thank you, Ray. So much wisdom, so much knowledge. I love seeing uh, the conversations in the chat and people sharing stories and experiences and questions and resources. Um, super fun. I'd love to see the Stoke. I know uh, Remy and Jenna have been including links to... Uh, everything that, that Ray touched on, there should be links in the chat. If you didn't see them, you should be able just to scroll up or down and find them. Or like Ray said, send a note to Matthew or Ray or reach out to us at Hip Camp and would be happy to point you in the right direction. You know, one of the things that I'd love to just end with, uh, giving it's the voting season, giving what Felipe just said, you know, one of the most important things we can do as well is getting our neighbors on board, right? We can have these these uh, parcels, we can have these, these places we call home, these landscapes that we're restoring. And if you think of them as an island, then go up in a hot air balloon and look down at your community, look down at the valley, the watershed, the place you live, and think about the impact you could have if you got your, your neighbor on board, or if you got your neighbor's neighbor on board. And then all of a sudden, these little stopover places where, you know, as Felipe said, that they remember that there's food there. You know, then all of a sudden your neighbor and you are working together on, on stewardship. Maybe you're sharing, splitting the cost of seeds. Maybe you're collaborating on a restoration project. Maybe you have a stream that goes through one neighbor's property and onto yours and you can work together and share goals and share tools and knowledge and perspective. And then all of a sudden you're doubling your impact, right? And so I think that's one of the things that's so inspiring about this community and this work 
because really the more people we get on board, the more of us who sign the pledge, who take on this, uh, this commitment to help save the migratory monarch, the greater we can, you know, the greater impact we can have in our communities and at large, because I don't know about people listening, but I bought I used to have a place in Montana and it was just orchard grass and invasive grasses. And I bought a single milkweed plant from the nursery and I was pulling it out of my car and I was in my driveway and a bee lands on it. And so literally if you build it, they will come. It all, all you need is, as, as Ray said, is maybe a $2 packet of seeds or a single milkweed to start, but so much magic can come from that one plant, get your neighbor involved. And all of a sudden you're doubling your impact, your neighbor's neighbor, you're tripling your impact. So um, yeah, thank you everybody for being here. Um, to Matthew and Ray, thank you for all the work that you do to save monarchs and to educate us and get us excited. Felipe, thank you for inspiring a generation, including so many people on this talk, I'm sure. Uh, and Jenna and Remy, yeah, thanks for running the show and keeping us on time and organized. Um, if Remy, if, do you have anything that you'd like to add before we close out? I don't think so, except for, um, make sure you sign our pledge and stay tuned for um, all the great things we're going to work on going forward. Awesome. Thank you cool. so much, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you, guys.